Okay, uh, good morning, everybody. Hope uh, everybody's having a good week. Uh, as usual, we're just giving it a minute or so to let everybody join uh, the Grand Rounds meeting. Um, this is, I believe, our fourth, I think Nira was saying, fourth or fifth gra Grand Round since we started doing it in this format. Uh, uh, with the COVID theme. And today we have the usual uh, uh, plan as we always have is uh, we're gonna start off with about 10 or 15 minutes of weekly announcements. And then uh, Dr. Uh, Upi Singh will be leading us today uh, with our presentation. Um, Dr. Harrington, I'm gonna turn it over to you in just a second. And I'm also going to just put up this slide here that I'm just gonna share it. Um, and I wanna just uh, mention again that we have as usual CME and I'll send, um, uh, the links through in a few minutes uh, over th through chat and with our CME we can uh, offer you credit where you can get it now or you can come to our uh, uh, website later in the day if you'd like and uh, you can see um, the link here and again I'm going to send it through chat and you can grab CME for today and also for all the past uh, CME um, uh, all the past grand rounds you can get CME for it as well as multiple other webinars throughout the School of Medicine and I'll send the links for all that in a minute. Uh, Dr. Harrington I'll turn it over to you now. Great thanks Errol and uh, thanks everybody for joining us. As Errol said we're continuing in medical grand rounds uh, our, our theme of trying to update the community both internal at Stanford, but we're increasingly realizing a lot of people outside of Stanford are, uh, are listening into these grand rounds. We want to provide you information on what's going on here at Stanford from the people who are actually leading the efforts at the front line. And so we'll go through uh, a series of short presentations. And then what we'd like to do today is really update you on a lot of the exciting clinical research that's going on and uh, or maybe more broadly the research that's going on on campus and uh, in response to, uh, to COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and that'll be led by Dr. Upi Singh, who's our division chief for infectious disease. And certainly her group has been front and center in, uh, in all of this the past couple of months. So Errol, let me turn it back to you for um, going through our panelists. And I look forward as always to see, hearing the moderated questions that uh, please do use the Q&A function. And Errol does a great job of curating that and uh, walking us through the questions, particularly ones that seem to rise to the top for the community. So again, thanks for joining. Errol, back to you. Great, thanks Dr. Harrington. Great, so we'll start back in with our updates. Uh, Dr. Weinecker, uh, would you like to start us off this morning? Sure. Um, news is continuing to look a little bit better in terms of the number of patients we have in the hospital. There are 13 um, COVID patients in the hospital. Uh, no PUIs. Of those 13 patients, only three are in the intensive care unit, which is really great. Uh, three are on ventilators. So that those numbers are down in terms of the numbers of people in the ICU and the numbers of people on ventilators. Um, a number that's up, which is really nice to hear, is the total number of patients in the hospital uh, today is up to 382 patients. As you know, we've got a, a capacity of about 620, give or take. Um, and we haven't been anywhere close to that in several weeks. And so this is the highest number I've actually seen in a while. There's still 47 ICU beds open. So we've got plenty of capacity. And hopefully if things continue to improve as we are expecting that they will, um, uh, we'll be able to start doing uh, some more elective kinds of things and begin to get back towards normal. Although that's obviously not anything that's gonna happen right away. Um, the uh, testing that we've been doing um, has been um, really quite successful. We've got, um, uh, in addition to the tests that we've been doing now for several weeks, uh, actually a couple of months, um, with a, a turnaround time of uh, under about 12 hours, um, we have the 45 minute rapid turnaround test that actually from the time the collection uh, the sample is collected until it's resulted, it's about an hour and a half, and that's really made a big difference. The sensitivity and specificity of those two tests seem to be about the same. The sensitivity and specificity of the uh, tests we've been doing for several weeks is, uh, sensitivity is about 96%, specificity is 100%. Um, and as they've been, uh, the lab has been validating the 45 minute test, um, has found it to be pretty similar. So um, in spite of the fact that uh, some people have wondered if it was valid um, and repeated the test uh, to be sure that negative really did mean negative. It looks like it really is a pretty good test. And they actually, in, in an attempt to validate that test, have been running the conventional test in the background. Um, so rather than reorder a test, you can actually just call the lab and ask them what the other test shows um, if you want to know that result. Ock Health has been doing um, a number of tests, five or 600 tests a day. 
Um, that uh, curve also seems to be flattening. The, the positive rate for testing in Oc Health has been about 3.18%. Um, but in terms of uh, the, how that represents the 15,000 employees um, and uh, staff here, it's 0.19% positive. Uh, so 0.19% of our, of our hospital staff is positive. And that's really also, um, I think, encouraging and, and good news that we have not seen that horrible surge that we were all so worried about. Um, in the state, um, there have been a, a total of, or there's a total of uh, 23,338 cases. Um, there have been 758 fatalities. Uh, that number has continued to go up a bit. Um, there's, uh, IHME is uh, suggesting that um, the death uh, rate should peak or the number of deaths should peak um, in another few days, or they're predicting April 19th. So um, overall, I think we have, um, we've been very lucky um, with how things have gone for us. Um, and I read something in the New York Times last night about um, the, the fact that we lost the Super Bowl, maybe why we, California has done so well. I don't know if anybody else saw that piece, but I thought it was kind of interesting. With that, I'll stop talking because I don't want to take up too much time. I don't want to do the to be what we did last week and uh, let her have an opportunity to talk. Uh, thanks so much, Anne. Uh, Dr. Huja, we'll move over to you next. Great. Thank you, Errol. And thanks, Anne, for that great uh, State of the Union from the clinical side. I wanted to update a few more aspects. If we can go to the next slide. So we understand, you know, the current volumes have somewhat been reduced or plateaued. No surge teams were activated for the inpatient wards, which is very reassuring. And all of the teaching services and other clinical services in the Department of Medicine remain stable. But we have to plan for the future. And that future um, is really a bit fuzzy in terms of when shelter in place will be lifted and what the impact of that will be. But we need to be prepared. And so what we did is we surveyed all of the clinical services in the Department of Medicine and got input from the clinical leaders. And one common theme that came out of this was the need for telemedicine. I think long beyond COVID um, you know, resolves, the, the telemedicine piece adds some flexibility and convenience both for the physician and the provider. So we will work on exploring that with the help of Topher Sharp. And there are certain services that wanted to do e-consults. So for example, in hematology, there are times when the peripheral smear is more valuable than the bedside exam. Sorry, Abraham, I did say that. <laughs> and um, you know, there are times when we would actually utilize these e-consults in a more efficient manner. Glenn Chertow warned us that there are gonna be uremic patients that do what's called sort of a crash landing into dialysis units and may have access problems. Eldrin Lewis said that um, you know, they're more, as patients are sort of self-monitoring and self-managing their uh, heart failure at home and escalating diuretics at home, we may see an increase in heart failure exacerbations in the very near future, as well as an increase in procedures because of the large backlogs of elective procedures for both cardiac and we should think about other surgical and procedural services as well. The downstream effects would be the impact on procedure rooms, the increased volume on the floors after these patients are done with their procedure, those that need to be escalated to the ICU and how that staffing will occur, and we'll talk about that in a second, the nursing and anesthesia staffing as well. So there's a lot of downstream domino effects to be considered. On the next slide, you'll see um, that the ICU is planning for a, um, Errol, if you could change to the next slide, please. Thank you. The um, ICU is actually planning for an additional team and with the help of several of its faculty in Mark Nichols' division, there's gonna be creation of an integrated chest center to help recruit patients with lung cancer from the entire surrounding Bay Area. And I think that'll be a really um, wonderful piece for Stanford to lead. Now, from the GI perspective and the oncology perspective, we know that there will be an impact of delayed preventive screening that has happened over the past few months and potentially slightly going forward and delayed monitoring of known conditions. And do these patients present with you know, more acute exacerbations from those complications or from uh, you know, things that did not get detected soon enough? From the hematology and oncology side, the volumes are anticipated to increase. We know in part because of the cancer center's growth and some patients having delay in their own treatment that they were on treatment protocols for. 
and we need to anticipate that there'll be more transfers from local hospitals for patients needing therapy. And finally, on the next slide, um, thank you. You know, one interesting piece that George Sledge from oncology mentioned is that during this COVID situation, there was a transition from intravenous chemotherapy to oral cancer therapies, just to reduce, you know, the, the burden of infusion treatments within the hospital, given that we were limiting who all would, you know, uh, come into the hospital urgently or emergently. And so that actually emphasized the need to eliminate or reduce the use of late line chemotherapies in non curative settings. So that started a conversation that will keep moving. Bill Robinson from rheumatology, as well as several other division chiefs in the Department of Medicine, are eager to get the labs back up and running. And, um, you know, there's a plan for that. And then with the help of Abraham Verghese and Ron Wittellis, we know that there are some medical education impacts. The most important thing to avoid super capping or overwhelming the house staff services. And that's being accommodated and planned for with the opening of some non-teaching services. It's just coincidental that they're odd numbers, but the creation of Med 7, the expansion of Med 9, and the creation of Med 11 in September. And then as Abraham had mentioned previously, the clerkship direct, uh, duration will be shortened for medical students, and we should anticipate that there'll be more students on consult services. I wanted to highlight on the next slide that um, you know, the chief residents oversee a, uh, a, a lot of house staff. It's about 127 house staff in conjunction with the oversight from the program directors and associate program directors. And they've done some really innovative things to help ensure medical education, wellness of the house staff, and the collegiality and, uh, and um, bonding that has occurred during this process. So they now have morning report, noon conference, and m and all via Zoom, and they can you know, track who's attending. They have a new chief uh, website, which I'll show you in a second, that has some fantastic uh, links that I encourage everyone to look at, not just the house staff, but fellows, faculty, and medical students. It's a really great site that we'll navigate through in a second. They have communication uh, in a very organized format um, with program leadership uh, guiding the process. And then a resident representative leading the wellness committee for the residency program, Alex Zubenko. And they actually have quarantine bingo and some Zoom classes. So they've made it fun and informative. And then finally, I thought it was really nice to hear that uh, one of our future chief residents, Mita, is chairing a service sort of committee where they've raised almost $20,000 for New York residency programs. And on the right side of the slide, you can see one of our faculty, Dean Winslow, uh, donating blood. Um, you see quarantine bingo and the different um, you know, slots that you can fill with your bingo chips. And then of course, the um, you know, GoFundMe helping for uh, resident support on the East Coast. On the next slide, there's a little play function. Um, and I want you to take a quick look because there's some amazing links that I do think would be informative for everyone. There's housing, childcare benefits, there's um, aspects for clinical COVID resources, testing, which has already been mentioned, the guidelines that are published on the internet, and then some external sites that you can access. And then finally, all of the morning report summaries so that you have all of the education captured on this website. So like I said, please do take a second to look at that when you get a chance. Some great wellness resources there as well. And then on my last slide, I wanted to highlight um, something that a group of medical students at Stanford have gotten together and formed what's called the COVID core. And they have formed a registry of volunteers that are medical students supporting SHC and the School of Medicine. They've helped with clinical studies, delivering meals for all of the um, staff, the frontline providers, both at Valley Care, and you'll see some of the providers at Valley Care on the right side of the screen, as well as Stanford Hospital in Palo Alto. They've worked on a database for COVID-19 efforts and PPE decontamination studies, and this is all out of just the kindness of their heart and their desire to help our Stanford community. And you'll see their names and faces here on the left. So just a really nice shout out to them. And with that, thank you. I'll turn it back over to Errol. Thanks so much, Nira. Uh, Dr. Mahoney. Thanks, Errol. Thanks, Nira. Um, good morning. Um, in ambulatory care, uh, we are, uh, you can forward to the next slide, we are continuing to identify and refine our current workplace and care delivery methods. 
that are proving to be quite flexible and can adapt uh, to the likely fluid changes that we can expect going forward, even during the reopening period. For example, now we're becoming accustomed to universal masking, uh, PPE protocols, and working in designated areas for COVID-related in-person care, and other current uh, preventative and, and protective measures that will drive lasting public health benefits as we continue to fight this uh, pandemic. And um, in addition, the focus of our ambulatory quality improvement projects, for example, are all pivoting towards uh, the COVID response and um, the care of COVID patients is further being refined. Uh, and patients are now receiving home monitoring with pulse oximetry. Uh, you know, the, uh, the technology for video visits is further uh, refined and um, senior care patients are now being proactively outreached uh, to uh, by social workers to assess their need for food delivery and other social services and um, and to engage in advanced care planning discussions and we're learning to convey um, our compassion and derive meaning from patient care despite the PPE and even uh, through a, a video visit so um, we're beginning to plan our, um, the ways in which we might uh, be able to further realize our digital health aspiration um, now that the overwhelming majority of our care is being delivered virtually. And I um, enjoyed uh, seeing uh, Dr. Harrington's interview uh, earlier this week on CNN covering the first responder testing program um, that was augmented with the release of, of an app. And in the future, we are planning to expand um, the uh, high priority testing to other frontline essential service workers, such as grocery uh, workers, public service workers across the Bay Area. And we're planning to um, expand uh, testing access to the most vulnerable populations, SNF residents, um, homeless populations, and those um, individuals who, who serve them and provide services to them throughout the Bay Area. And this is through partnerships with community clinics and with city and county governments and, and the surrounding area, and that's very exciting. Marina Martin and uh, her, our, our geriatric colleagues are um, reaching out to local senior living facilities to provide uh, basic infection uh, prevention and PPE training to the staff. And, um, and that is particularly important given the acute uh, public health risk in these environments. And in addition, um, we're engaging with our research partners to develop uh, therapeutics and other evidence-based interventions and are really benefiting from UPI's and, and Ken's leadership um, in, in this realm. And then um, along the lines of bringing back the joy of practice, you can see some photographs here. You know, we've, we've talked about how um, now we have um, uh, been um, uh, afforded the um, capability of providing uh, care at home in a safe environment. We also are very familiar with the use of PPE that gives us a sense of safety and promotes wellness. In addition uh, to the Well MD and Well PhD uh, program and the package of services that are available to promote self care and the care of um, our families, um, I wanted to um, highlight. Um, two uh, demonstrations here that evolved and emerged over the last week um, that, that I think speaks to um, our ability to derive meaning in the interactions that we have with our patients, even in this environment where we're using PPE and it can be scary and, um, and feel like we're, we're far away from our patients and, and through video visits. So the first example is, uh, is the PPE portrait uh, project that's led by Katie Brown Johnson and entails um, providing healthcare workers with a photo of themselves, as you can see here, on top of their gown. And the idea here is to really humanize the testing interaction at our testing site. And um, the, the label is placed at the heart level, as uh, Katie Brown Johnson says, because that's where, um, you know, we, we want to provide the care is from our heart. And, um, and this, it turns out to be the most uh, popular uh, Stanford Medicine Instagram post ever. 
Um, and even uh, at the testing sites, a lot of the patients are wanting to take selfies uh, with, uh, with the swabbers because uh, it's been um, you know, so well received. And then um, speaking of uh, coming from the heart, I also uh, wanted to highlight the serious uh, illness care program led by uh, Winnie Tudorberg and her team. Um, the, um, the focus is now on communication around COVID and how to warmly and effectively communicate with patients um, around sensitive topics such as advanced care planning over video. And at yesterday's webinar, I particularly enjoyed learning that, you know, in those moments when um, usually we would place our, our hand on a patient or place our hand on, on um, place our hand on the hand of the patient or on their shoulder, um, in those moments we can still convey that we're there for our patients by just placing our hand over our heart and looking directly, um, you know, into the camera and stating something. Um, um, uh, empathic, like um, with all that is going on, um, what is worrying you the most? And sort of uh, still feeling that connection that I know brings up a lot of joy in what we're doing. So um, with that, um, that's um, my report out. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, uh, Megan. Appreciate it. Um, and next we'll move over to uh, Dr. Shen. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing my slides so you can start sharing yours. And Dr. Shen is going to provide us some updates again uh, from the emergency department. And uh, for those of you asking, I'll, I'll grab the links uh, that you're requesting. I think, Nira, there's a couple of requests for um, the links that you shared. I think one for the chief resident's website. So I'll pull it off your slides and share that in just a moment. That's great. All right, thank you, everyone. Um, I thought that I would just take this uh, moment to uh, provide some uh, updates in terms of uh, how we've been using technology in the emergency department. I'll just share a few highlights. I know I mentioned in the past uh, how we're using telemedicine. So again, I just wanted to uh, provide a little bit more context. Um, as uh, you may recall, early on when we were testing, um, you know, we had to have patients uh, in uh, negative pressure rooms. And in the emergency department, we only have four uh, negative pressure rooms and two in the pediatric ED. And so we recognize that as the testing capability expanded, we're going to anticipate more patients coming to the ED uh, to be tested. And so early on, our initial intervention was to uh, put these isolation tents outside, just immediately outside the entrance. And, um, you know, we worked with infection prevention and control. Um, these are all at least minimum six feet apart um, and allows uh, us to test patients who are ambulatory and well um, and can be discharged home. Uh, but there's still a limitation to this uh, space. And so we wanted to uh, employ a model, the drive-through model, which um, back in 2009, uh, my co uh, former colleagues had developed a uh, drive-through model for uh, H1N1 in 2009. And so we took, uh, we were inspired by that and modified it for 2020. And essentially the thought is that we wanted to compress the screening registration, uh, nurse assessment, uh, physician assessment um, using telemedicine and the swab and discharge all into one uh, um, encounter. And again, kind of inspired by the kind of NASCAR pit crew uh, teamwork style where it's uh, highly efficient. Um, so with that in mind, um, we set up our drive-through with the following process. Um, there is a nurse screener that's in full PPE and as patients uh, walk up or drive up, they will be asked certain questions and if you met certain criteria. Um, and ultimately you have to be well appearing. And again, if you meet these criteria, you would be um, directed to the area of our garage that we took over uh, to do the drive-through testing. Uh, the patient would uh, take a picture, scan their driver's license, and they would uh, text it to the registration uh, folks ahead of time. So by the time they drove to the area uh, in 30 seconds, uh, uh, the registration team could start registering and get the patient uh, uh, into the system, armbands printed, etc. And they would actually even identify the vehicle model number just to keep track of the, uh, the patient. Here's a visual of um, where they'd be directed to the path of travel to the area in the garage. Um, where we set up uh, two lanes that can, uh, with a capacity of six cars uh, in, in, uh, in each lane. Uh, in this area, um, we're, we work with our uh, Office of Emergency Management, facilities, a lot of people to, to set up kind of the infrastructure. Specifically, the most important thing was Wi-Fi, uh, of course, uh, electricity. Um, we also had set up a hand washing station, cold zones and hot zones. Um, there were folks to help direct traffic with signs, uh, as well as all the various supplies. 
And so as you can see, um, there's a team uh, in front of the car uh, with uh, equipment and there's a nurse um, along with the other uh, necessary equipment. Once the patient uh, pulls up, um, as I mentioned, there's a nurse, a tech, and that would go, uh, go alongside the patient, whether in the passenger side or the uh, driver's side. Um, the physician would be in the main ED and a cart would be pulled up alongside the patient. And we have a dedicated physician on shift uh, that would be assessing these patients with standing protocols for the nurse to carry out. And if the patient passes the screen, um, then uh, the order for the COVID test um, along with possibly the rapid uh, flu test or the full respiratory panel could be ordered as well. Uh, but the uh, physician would do the quick assessment, the uh, nurse would do the swab, and the patient would be discharged uh, with paperwork for uh, some COVID information. If you walked in, you would also be directed to this area as well, just a separate space alongside um, the drive-through um, uh, uh, area uh, where you could also sit and be evaluated by the physician via telemedicine. Um, the second example is uh, something that I think all of you are familiar with. Um, in the ED, we deployed about 120 or so iPads. So every single room along with all the physician and nursing workstation uh, have iPads. So that, um, you know, we found this to be actually a much more cost effective and easier way to communicate with patients versus the larger telemedicine cards that were much more expensive and cumbersome. Uh, so with these, again, it's very simply that the uh, physician, nurse, staff member, tech, anybody can uh, master call into a iPad um, that, uh, that basically can uh, auto uh, answer for the patients. And we're using this and our estimate is that uh, we reduce the amount of PPE use usage by at least about 70% uh, per patient encounter. Uh, here's just an example of a uh, view from the physician side looking into a patient room. Our scribes also uh, are sitting outside uh, telemedicine into the patient room to document for the uh, physician as well. Our consultants are using this. Um, what we found is that psychiatry in particular had um, been very uh, pleased with this process. Um, one of our psychiatry uh, colleagues was able to even telemed in from uh, his office uh, to do a consult and so um, don't even have to come into the ED. Another example is uh, of our technology is um, is relatively small, but again, is meaningful. Um, we deploy these butterfly ultrasounds, so these handhelds. And so point of care ultrasound is a big part of emergency medicine practice. And to have these portable ultrasounds, pretty much the size of a stethoscope, um, they can put it, you know, physician can put it in your uh, pocket. And when you walk in, you can plug it into the iPad that's already in the room. You can put a disposable sheath over it. And so from an infection prevention perspective, it just makes it so much cleaner uh, and less cumbersome in order to, uh, versus rolling in a machine uh, that we currently uh, would do prior to, to COVID. And lastly, I just wanted to mention that um, working with our radiology colleagues, um, we are able to shoot uh, chest x-rays through the glass door. And um, so essentially you see a picture of a tech handing uh, the plate over to a nurse uh, who during the initial phase, and we have, we have standing orders for oftentimes labs, x-rays based on certain criteria. So um, in, one, uh, in one shot, we can have the nurse draw the blood, settle the patient, uh, receive the glass plate and position the patient so that the patient can have the x-ray shot. And um, based on our experience so far, the quality has been very good. There's very uh, minimal scatter and we're still refining the technique uh, based on body habitus, but it's something that has helped been helpful in terms of, again, infection prevention and reducing uh, PPE. And so um, with that, I'll turn it uh, back over to Errol. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sam. I appreciate it. Uh, Dr. Chang from Occupational Health is going to provide some updates as well now. Oh, uh, Song, you're uh, muted right now. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, four, uh, over the last four days, zero new positives uh, among employees and faculty. Uh, so uh, that's a great sign. And uh, that's in spite of uh, testing anybody with any sniffle or uh, and everybody uh, who's caught at the front door. You all know that we're now testing at the front door. Uh, the interesting news is there's a longish tail for PCR uh, positivity, and only a third of the people who are positive are ready to go back to work at 14 days by nasal swab. We may be oversensitive, but given the small numbers, we'd rather protect the larger workforce. Uh, our longest is 29 days took to uh, clear PCR in their uh, empty swab. 
uh, we started serologic testing uh, uh, as a pilot, and you'll hear a lot more about the serology, but our first cohort of 90 uh, lab uh, workers and, and managers, uh, the great news, zero uh, asymptomatic shedders. We are doing simultaneous PCR and serology uh, to get as much information as possible. Uh, only two ha were positive for IgG, uh, indicating some uh, past infection, and one had zero symptoms uh, that they can recall, and the other had uh, minor symptoms. Uh, two positive IgMs, which may indicate early recovery of disease or uh, cross reactivity with uh, another coronavirus. So we're planning for the future of occupational health, uh, trying to figure out how to uh, ensure our continuous readiness, even as we are winding down our, our current operation. And one final uh, note for folks on the call that uh, our new uh, cadre of residents, fellows and trainees, uh, we are planning on how to effectively screen them and prepare them in time, given the relatively tight timeframes that they usually have. Song, thanks so much. Appreciate it. And then our last uh, update, uh, Dr. Scott Boyd. Uh, great, thank you so much. Hi, yeah, and so um, I can update that uh, we've now been doing the serology testing for about a week in the clinical lab, and we have plenty of capacity. Um, we've actually been getting you know fewer orders than we expected. I think we've done somewhere around 260 or 70 uh, specimens up to now. Um, the, uh, yeah, the results are, uh, are encouraging in the sense that we're seeing somewhere around 3% of all the specimens sent have either IgG, IgM, or both. It's about evenly scattered between those, those three different possibilities. And, um, you know, we've, we've been looking at the, uh, for people that are PCR positive by nasal pharyngeal swab, what's the uh, proportion that are positive up when, when you take the sample in the first week post onset of symptoms between the first and second week, second and third, and then after the third week? And so if you want just some quick numbers, that's basically around 25% of people are seropositive in that first week, about 65% seropositive in that second week, 90% if you look in that between the second and third week, and about 100 or 97% uh, for IgM if you look after three weeks uh, post onset of symptoms. So I think it's, um, you know, I think the test is performing pretty well. Those numbers are um, similar to what others have seen in some of the preprints that are out there. And um, yeah, I think there's been some debate, I think, about should this be done on, on everyone or on certain groups and so on, but the laboratory's uh, you know, ready to perform the testing and uh, to help support that. And I think this will really, along with the PCR testing, help to empower all the research that will go forward with uh, all the Stanford patients and so on. So I'd like to thank everyone who contributed to the effort. Um, Great, uh, Dr. Boyd, uh, Scott, thanks so much. Uh, we definitely have a couple questions we'll try to get to um, after our main presentation, but thanks so much for joining us and being part of the updates. I also wanna thank um, a few other doctors, Dr. Tompkins, Lucy Tompkins, Ben Pinsky, uh, Abraham Bergius, who are also with us on the panel and can help answer questions when we get to them as needed. So thanks for being with us today and, and every week. Um, Dr. Upi Singh, who's the uh, chief of our division of infectious disease is now gonna uh, talk more about the research and all the great research that's, being, uh, that's happening here at Stanford. And I'll turn it over to you, Upi. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. Sure, my pleasure. So good morning, everyone. Um, it's great to see all 1,400 of you um, on Zoom. So as Errol mentioned, uh, I'm gonna talk about the clinical research opportunities that have been happening, uh, as well as the institutional response and the scientific pursuits. Um, this is a co-presentation with Ken Mahaffey, who uh, uh, I've been working with uh, in the School of Medicine, and unfortunately, he wasn't able uh, to be here today. So in the next slide, um, I think all of us uh, recognize that there's one thing this pandemic has created, which is an incredible opportunity for research. Um, I think we just have more questions, really, uh, than answers, and research is the only way to really get answers. And the WHO also recognized this in March of 2020. They released this uh, coordinated global uh, research program roadmap. Um, and if you advance to the next slide, Errol, uh, you'll see that they uh, outlined seven areas um, of uh, focus, including looking at vaccines, candidate therapeutics, understanding the natural history of the virus, looking at epidemiological studies, et cetera. And so this is an interesting read. Um, I think this is one of the first times we've had a pandemic um, of this nature in this age. Um, and so I think it's, it's a really a great opportunity to think about how all of us can, can, can contribute. 
uh, to the research um, environment. Next slide, Errol. Um, I think uh, it's also important to realize that the times are changing and our local guidelines and our safety parameters have tried desperately to keep up with disease spread. I just wanted to show a brief outline. So on March 14th, um, when uh, uh, shelter in place had not yet happened, uh, we were already doing social distancing, uh, meetings um, were being limited, but science was continuing. Um, and then next, um, you'll see that even just a few days later, our shelter in place was announced. Um, on March 16th, and this is when um, essential services uh, and uh, everything that wasn't essential research stopped. Uh, on the next um, thing, you'll see that uh, very quickly, it was recognized that um, certain essential research must continue. And then how do we define what is essential uh, research in the COVID environment uh, and what is COVID related research? And so on, Mar on April 1st, um, uh, Ruth O'Hara announced the formation on the next slide, um, Errol, of uh, this committee that Ken Mahaffey and I lead. Uh, this is the COVID-19 Clinical Research Review Panel. Uh, it was created by Ruth O'Hara, uh, Ken Mahaffey and I lead it um, to sort of understand how best to uh, make sure that COVID-related research is done safely, uh, to make sure it's coordinated and to make sure there's synergy uh, between the different programs. On the next slide, you'll see the different working groups that are within um, this committee. Uh, and um, each of these has very able uh, leadership and partnership. So we have a biobanking uh, work group, um, data analytics and real-time evidence, uh, population health and community engagement, uh, important group of health services research, important group on interventional trials, as well as quality improvement. Uh, and so everybody has been spending um, uh, up to three meetings a week, spending their time, their energy, their engagement, as well as their expertise. And I think uh, that that has been really um, helpful. On the next slide, you'll also see um, that none of this in terms of clinical research can occur without our partners. And one of the important partners I wanna point out is the IRB. Um, if you just look at from March 9th to April 14th, they've approved 67, um, COVID-19 protocols, 51 are further under review and 43 are in presentation in preparation. The medium time to approval is 5.2 days. So I think um, this ensures that the research can move forward safely for ourselves, but also for our patients. And we just really need to understand that none of the research response uh, would be possible without our colleagues at IRB as well as RMG. So we really do thank them. On the next slide, you'll also see the different efforts that the Department of Medicine has done. Uh, and these are uh, just sort of highlights, but uh, a lot of different things. Uh, the Quantitative Sciences Unit, uh, led by Manisha Desai, has created the framework for study design management, monitoring, and analysis of COVID trials. SCCR, the Stanford Center for Clinical Research, has mobilized a number of COVID-19 clinical research teams, including staff, helping with regulatory compliance, training, uh, they're collaborating with multidisciplinary stakeholders across the school and the department, as well as the hospital. And then the research administration core that's housed in the Department of Medicine is collaborating with multiple divisions and is committed to assisting faculty with applications for COVID research funding and so far has helped um, uh, faculty uh, submit proposals of over 22 million, which is really fabulous. On the next slide, what I wanted to do was Um, show um, the schematic. Uh, so this is what um, Ken uh, always says when we're um, at these uh, clinical research meetings that we're, we're rebuilding the plane while trying to fix it and we all have a piece and I think that's really essential and I've tried to highlight you know the support from RMG, the support from IRB, the support from the department um, uh, as, as well as the School of Medicine and SHC and I think that really is uh, very true. Next slide. So I just wanna spend a few minutes to talk about some of the work that's been accomplished. And again, this is a, simply a snapshot as of last night. I wanna take special um, time to emphasize efforts across the School of Medicine. Um, I'm gonna talk about some interdisciplinary programs across different departments, which I think are just so fabulous. Uh, I wanna make sure we connect and talk about what our basic science colleagues are doing in this pandemic. I think it's especially important to highlight the work that the frontline, frontline individuals are doing 
And uh, we've talked a lot about data sciences and others, and so I'm gonna highlight activities that haven't been recently covered. I uh, wanna start by saying this is a small portion of the many activities, um, and uh, I hope that uh, Grand Rounds or other formats will be a way to share research efforts on a regular basis. So I apologize to all whose um, work I'm not able to cite. Again, I just sort of tried to, to think across those themes that are listed above. So on the next slide, I think it's really important to talk about interdisciplinary uh, successes. And so here I'm highlighting two multi-departmental successes. Uh, the first is what Scott just talked about. This is the development of the serology test. And I just think it's amazing to think that this is a collaboration with pathology leading it, but with ChemH, structural biology, as well as infectious diseases. And the faculty that were involved in this are Scott Boyd, Peter Kim, Ted Darjewski, and Taya Wang, and of course, all of their lab members. And, um, and Scott can correct me if there's others that I forgot to mention, but as everybody recognizes, this is a really important addition to our diagnostic abilities. It's gonna answer important questions about community exposure. Um, I think uh, some of the numbers that we're hearing this morning about like three to 4% positivity um, is good, <laughs> but there's also some uh, questions that it raises in terms of uh, lack of herd immunity and what it means going forward. But again, this is, this, you know, uh, is um, uh, the second level of testing that's now available after PCR, and it really highlights just um, what Stanford does best, which is work uh, together, work with people, and sort of bring uh, great technology. I also want to mention another uh, great collaboration across three departments. This is from the Department of Pediatrics, Emergency Department, uh, the Frontline People, and then Pathology as well. This is Bonnie Maldonado, Andra Blumkall's group, as well as Ben Pinsky. They're looking at uh, validating specimens uh, that are collected differently, maybe by the person themselves versus those by the healthcare worker. Any of you who's, ha who, um, who's had a NP swab knows it's not the most pleasant experience. Um, it exposes uh, the person to some discomfort. It exposes the uh, person who's collecting to some risk. And so um, what Bonnie, Andre, and Ben are doing are looking at self-collected materials and maybe focus on, and are focusing on samples that are easier to collect. And I think this will be, if this can be proven to be effective, it's really gonna suggest that we can safely and effectively collect specimens outside of the healthcare setting and will facilitate more frequent testing, um, et cetera. Um, I'm just seeing a note from Scott that uh, Jennifer Cochran uh, was uh, in BioE, was instrumental in getting the serology test up and running and, and I apologize. So this is pathology, ChemH, structural biology, ID, as well as um, uh, BioE. Next slide. Um, I think it's also important to highlight the connections with the basic sciences. And I, I, I chose to talk about biobanking um, as a shared resource for all. And I'm just gonna give some examples here, but again, this is gonna continue and expand even further. So Catherine Blish and Angela Rogers um, got samples from hospitalized patients with uh, COVID, again, all under IRB um, uh, purview. And I just wanna give an example of the different samples that have been shared with different colleagues. So Catherine is doing single cell RNA-seq of PBMCs. Taya, Scott, and Peter and others use the plasma to validate some of the serologic assays. Uh, Scott Boyd and Mark Davis are looking at B cell and T cell receptor sequencing. Uh, Bali Palindrome is looking at uh, ways to study the innate immune response. You can see that Holden Maker, Mark Davis, and Angela Rogers are looking at cytokine assessment, and Angela is specifically looking at immune parameters that distinguish COVID from ARDS from sepsis. Mike Snyder uh, and others are looking at metabolomics and proteomics. The ED colleagues are very interested in looking at um, ARDS and sepsis signatures. Uh, Jason Andrews and you and Ashley are looking at viral uh, sequencing, and multiple others are also exploring. And I just want to highlight the two sentences at the bottom of the slide, which is that all the collaborators are required to share the data. One lab is picked to run a specific assay and then all share. And this is to make sure that we avoid duplication of effort and that these precious samples are used um, optimally. And a, an analogous approach has been developed by, by, by the ED leaders uh, in this um, Andres group as well as others, uh, and also for the outpatient sample. So I think there's gonna be a ton more to come. And this is just highlighting the work that's being done and I really look forward to seeing the data that emerge. Next slide. <clears throat> I wanna give a special uh, couple of shout outs to our frontline colleagues. And here's an example of um, what um, Megan talked about in primary care. And one of the issues that urgent care dealt with very early in this pandemic was how do primary care providers take care of patients during a pandemic setting? 
Uh, I think you've all heard over the last several weeks that they had a very rapid transformation within three weeks to having more than 80% of visits um, and more than 75% of primary care visits uh, switched to video visits. So this work has just been published, will be coming out in the New England Journal of Medicine Catalyst. Um, and the title of the paper is listed there, the rapid transformation of greater than 75% primary care visits within three weeks at Stanford, our response to a public safety crisis. And a shout out to my Artandi, Sam Thomas, Narab Shah, as well as Malathi Srinivasan who've led this. I think they have a couple of other um, papers also coming out. So to us, to me, this is a great example of what you can do um, both to facilitate patient care, uh, to, to contribute to scholarship and to show, sort of lead the way of what we can do. I believe that as of today, they're also uh, launching a, a clinic called Crown, which is a care and respiratory observation of patients with novel coronavirus. So I look forward to seeing um, all the scholarship as well as all the clinical uh, benefits of these programs. Next slide. Um, I also want to highlight uh, efforts that all the uh, trainees are doing. And here's an example of um, a paper that's uh, coming out on the GI manifestations of COVID-19. All of us who are looking at the data emerging from China saw that there seems to be a very high prevalence of concurrent GI manifestations and, and COVID-19. And uh, the, the two trainees here uh, led this effort where they looked at 116 patients with confirmed uh, SARS-CoV infection who presented to the ED and showed that 33% of them presented with concurrent GI manifestations as listed there. And this work uh, is uh, published now in gastroenterology. So again, a shout out to the, to the trainees um, who um, are uh, taking the initiative. Next slide. I think there's, um, you know, I think one of the things I started with was saying is that one thing we know, we know is how little we know. And so one of the main questions that's out there is how much COVID disease is there. And I think everybody knows it from PCOR, Jeremy Goldhuber Fieber, Josh Solomon and others are doing modeling uh, for the epidemic, uh, looking at the demand for hospital surge here as well as in other places. A number of people, um, Iran Ben David, Jay Bhattacharya, Julie Parsonet and Jason Andrews, as I've listed there, are interested in doing serious surveys of um, different areas in Santa Clara and Sonoma. Uh, Julie and Jason are interested specifically on underserved populations, and uh, it'll be really interesting to see uh, the data that emerged from all of these efforts. Next slide. I think a lot of questions around how we continue to diagnose COVID are there. I wanted to again highlight uh, just a few uh, examples. Um, so the, uh, there's a study being led by Andre Kumar uh, from Hospital Medicine with help from John Kugler and Charles Lau. It's uh, ultrasound for pneumonia progression. And uh, this is a great example where Stanford is a primary lead in this, but they've incorporated colleagues at Valley Care as well as at UCSF and SFGH. And uh, that study has launched. It'll be really interesting uh, to see the results of that. Uh, Mike Snyder and others are looking at early detection of infection systems, symptoms using wearable devices. Um, I think that'll be great. Um, everybody who's been involved in anything with COVID knows that the NP swabs and their lack thereof uh, became a big issue. And so uh, Christina Kong has been uh, looking at validating 3D printed nasopharyngeal swabs um, from pathology. And then a um, large number of ED colleagues, Jane Quinn, uh, Sam Yang and others are looking at if we can develop, if they can develop clinical predictors of COVID-19 uh, from uh, patients seen in the ED. So again, these are great examples of sort of how we can uh, diagnose uh, um, COVID-19. And then of course, um, how do we treat COVID-19? That's one of the questions that comes up. I think people know there's multiple clinical trials underway. And uh, in this, I wanna make sure we highlight the collaborations with SCCR and QSU, and those have been instrumental. Wanna give a special shout out to Valley Care, where the first clinical trial um, ever launched. Um, and uh, it was a, a treatment um, option for COVID-19. Here are some other examples as well. Uh, Joe Levitt uh, is looking at a different bi uh, a bidirectional oxygenation valve to improve hypoxia and COVID-19 pneumonia. And then I wanted to just give this link uh, and see, so this is a, a website that Bob Schaefer in Infectious Disease um, has put together this research database. Uh, if, uh, it's free to everyone. If you click on it, uh, you can see uh, that you can select, for example, by target, and uh, maybe we'll pick the polymerase um, uh, protein of the, 
of the virus and you can scroll down, you can see all the data, all the publications, the EC50s. I think this is a really good, um, he, he and his team um, have spent, you know, they're experts in, in antiviral databases. They have a, a database for HIV as well as Hep C. And this is just a really great resource um, that uh, he's put forward. So I, I wanna thank him for that. If we go back to our slides, <clears throat> Um, I think also there's a lot of efforts and, uh, at Stanford for looking for new drugs to fight SARS-CoV-2. Uh, Jeff Glenn in, uh, in the GI division, as well as Shereed Ainov, are, are, are tackling this um, hard and fast. I just want to show a schematic of uh, the approach that Shereed has taken, um, which is to really look at the host pathways. And this is, leverages a lot of the work that's been done for a number of years. Uh, they're targeting the cellular kinases, AAK1 and GAC. Uh, that regulate intracellular trafficking of multiple RNA viruses. There's a couple of drugs, uh, sunitinib and erlotinib, er 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 that are already approved anti-cancer drugs. And uh, Sharid and her group have shown previously that these have broad spectrum antiviral activity in vitro, including versus SARS-CoV. So these agents are now being tested against SARS-CoV-2, and we look forward to seeing the results of that as well as uh, the studies that Jeff Glenn is doing. So I think there's going to be a lot of things emerging. And I think this is one of the points of research is it will be great to identify new compounds against SARS-CoV-2, but we also need to add to the repertoire of compounds that will be available for when there's um, related viruses uh, that may emerge or if SARS-CoV-2 becomes um, potentially a seasonal um, uh, infection. Next slide. Um, I think just want to end by a couple of slides to sort of talk about where, where we treat patients and where we can do uh, clinical studies. And so I think everybody on this um, call recognizes that the first priority uh, uh, was treatment options for hospitalized patients. And although there were no currently approved treatments, there's an in intense international focus with over 130 clinical trials underway uh, in the hospitalized setting. Uh, but next, I think as uh, things stabilize and as we sort of look to the next stage, uh, we look at how we have to treat the masses. And here we wanna look at treatment options for outpatient populations, those who have milder symptoms and in whom we hope to prevent hospitalization. That would be the biggest clinical outcome. But I also think it's important to think that this is an opportunity to prevent viral shedding and transmission. You can reduce transmission in families, limit community spread, and encourage early return to productivity. And in order to facilitate this, uh, we're really pleased that the School of Medicine leadership uh, is supporting the establishment of a COVID CTRU. And uh, the first set of studies uh, in this uh, COVID CTRU will be launched uh, hopefully soon. These should be studies that look at everything from antiviral or, or drug treatment to uh, 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 serology testing, to community uh, testing, to uh, wearable devices. So anything that needs to be done with the COVID um, positive patient or, or household members uh, can be done uh, at this location. Next slide. So I think um, hopefully you've gotten the sense that there's a lot of science underway and I've just given a snapshot and, and I, I think it is important to just think about what's next. And um, I, I, I know that we all agree that we want to prioritize synergy and avoid silos and ensure that all succeed. And to that end, I just am um, going to give my personal perspectives, which is that I think we do want to think about um, who saw the patients, who got the samples, and who facilitated the science. And I would really encourage that all clinicians, whether they're urgent care, ED, hospital medicine, ID, ICU, Oc Health, or any other frontline colleagues be acknowledged in the research output that will come from all of your efforts. Um, I think there are a lot of things including operational work um, and successes that allow the utilization of technology uh, to be developed at Stanford. And these um, operational successes also should be acknowledged uh, in scholarship. All of us who use any Stanford signature technology, I would encourage all of us to engage the scientific as well as the frontline colleagues. And I think this is really an example where everybody can succeed. Um, as we think about the output of this research, which will be grants and papers, um, I think, you know, there's an opportunity to think about uh, developing some publication guidelines within uh, groups and uh, a couple of the departments um, in the School of Medicine are already talking about this. You know, there's certainly ways to make sure everybody succeeds. You can think of co-first and co-senior authors. You can think of rotating first and senior authorship. 
I think having those conversations ahead of time will hopefully limit um, any uh, uh, concern later. Um, I think that uh, collaboration and publishing meaningful substantial papers rather than small pieces of the pie um, are our best and that's already uh, something that's being seen nationally and being supported by journals. And again, I, I want to end by just saying that we really want to support our junior colleagues, um, and, uh, including women scientists and clinicians, URMs, and that we want to be aware of our unconscious bias that all of us have um, and to really put forward in an in a honest and authentic way the people that have done the work. I think that's my last slide. Um, there, are, there are some others here. But it's a, oh yeah, no, this, um, I hope um, uh, that uh, Mike Snyder doesn't mind, but I wanted to mention to people, there's a COVID crowd that gets together twice a week. Um, this is a, an effort that Mike's uh, group uh, started. It's a bi-weekly Zoom meeting to discuss research activities. Uh, facilities cohorts. Um, it's Tuesdays and Fridays, and each time they discuss an overview as well as have two individuals who talk about the work. So with that, I'll, I'll thank everyone, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks so much, Opie. And for this, we'll, we'll probably edit out the password when we put this on YouTube, but yeah. uh, if people see this, are seeing this later, uh, if it's edited out, they can reach out to either us or um, Dr. Schneider's team to, to get the correct information. Thanks for sharing that. Um, Dr. Singh, thank you so much for that great presentation of some of the amazing research that's happening here. I'm going to stop sharing now. And we're going to move on to, um, as, as usual, a lot of the questions come up from the very beginning before, uh, Opie, before mm -hmm. you start talking. So yes. a lot of the prioritized questions are not related to your topic, although I'm sh I can tell there's lots of questions related, related to yours as well. But given our um, only about five, we're going to go about a little bit over like we have been doing to try to get to some of the most pressing questions. We'll try to go about five minutes or so after uh, nine o'clock. I'm just going to go straight to the most um, uh, voted up questions. And again, thank you to all the uh, panelists for joining us this morning and for everybody for being here. Uh, so going straight into the first question, uh, uh, the California governor announced the possibility of relaxing social distancing in two weeks. Is this realistic or will this just result in a second wave? Uh, perhaps you guys can clarify. I know in two weeks he's going to announce some of the hard dates about when we'll start reopening the economy. Um, I think that um, that's a tough question to answer right now. It is a great opportunity to plug um, our town hall this week, which surrounds modeling. Uh, Nigam Shah, Kristen Stoudemire, Kevin Shulman, Josh Solomon, and, and others will be presenting modeling. And we, we as you see, can see, we have limited time and lots of information. So we created a dedicated town hall just on modeling. And our hope is time permitting, we can also do weekly updates with a little bit of information as, from modeling as needed. Um, any other comments from our panelists? Well, uh, Errol, maybe I'll say one thing is this is going to be in the theme of what Upi talked about, a collaboration. We're going to need to collaborate between uh, all the people on the front lines doing the testing, our pathology colleagues like Scott and Ben to help us understand what those results mean. We need the epidemiologists to uh, help us under, put it into context. And we need to begin to rethink how do we, for example, make sure that Stanford Healthcare is ready to go and Lucille Packard Children's Health is ready to go as we open up a broader society. So those conversations are taking place on our campus. Uh, there's been a series of working groups found, uh, formed around that. Uh, so more to come and maybe Errol in the next couple of weeks, we can update the community more broadly as to the Stanford plans. Great. Sounds perfect. Thanks, Dr. Harrington. Uh, next question, uh, can you discuss the performance of the SHG antibody tests? Has it been validated? Uh, what, so Scott, uh, any other data on the, the, you mentioned some numbers. Yeah, so I can, can say the, the thing with the serology test is, you know, um, what's the gold standard supposed to be? You know, if you know that somebody's infected because they're PCR positive, you don't expect to see the antibodies in the early time, you know, the first week after they're infected. So. Um, those numbers that I said earlier um, in patients, you know, up to the first week after their uh, onset of symptoms that are known to be PCR positive, um, that's, we detect about 25% of those people having antibodies. Between week one and two, it's about six, 65%. Between week two and three, about 90%. And after week three, post onset of symptoms, it's close to 100%. So that's, you know, those are the sensitivities we get of detecting whether somebody's infected. Um, and currently there's no, no other, you know, perfect test gold standard for comparing those one, results to when we have compared to one of the European approved um, test kits, that Euroimmune one, our results were basically identical to theirs. So uh, we think that we're sort of performing at the level of ones that have been, that have undergone regulatory review, review in Europe. In terms of the specificity, 
In our validation testing, we looked at 120 samples and we didn't get uh, a single false positive in that. We, we've seen one false positive, we think, since then, um, but that's sort of in the range of our, uh, our current understanding of the test. And, and we'll certainly learn more as we go on and uh, apply it more widely, but that was part of the you know, calculation. Is it better to start getting data sooner or uh, wait for massive studies that might have taken months to, uh, to proceed? But we think the assay is performing pretty well um, for a serology test. Scott, thanks so much for the, your reply. Um, I'm moving on next question. Uh, are we getting information back from the Santa Clara Sarah survey study that took place a few weeks ago? Um, I, uh, Upi, I know you mentioned that in your slide. Um, I, I reached out to Ron and he, he, of course, they're welcome to present when, uh, if and when ready. Um, and I th still think we uh, have a week or two away from results to be available. I, I can address that in part, Earl. Perfect. Yeah, so um, we, over the past weekend with a nice uh, collaborative interaction with Errol and, uh, and Jay and others who were involved in that study, we, we compared the, the test characteristics of those devices to the, to the Stanford Clinical Lab test. And so we, they actually had residual samples from the community um, sampling. And we found that of the ones that were positive um, on those, um, with those kits that were donated by um, somebody from the Premier Biotech company, that was not a Stanford developed test, uh, but it was used for that study. We found that of the ones that were positive, we think about a third of them um, didn't have a positive signal in the Stanford Clinical Lab test. Um, that may be because the samples sat around a while after their study before we could get them to analyze, uh, to, to re-evaluate. So I think that, um, and we had some indication that there might've been some positives that were missed in that community survey, but um, I think that they're preparing the results for a, a full presentation with um, a full description of the kind of comparison that we, we did as well. Um, so that's, that's the information that I know about that. That's been a very nice uh, collaborative interaction for everybody. Thanks so much, Scott. We'll move on to a couple more questions here. Uh, what are people's opinions on the reports of reinfection, reactivation from South Korea? Uh, perhaps Upi or Lucy, um, any thoughts on that? So <clears throat> I'm happy to address that. Yeah, there have been some um, articles in the late press uh, about this. It's obviously, um, concerning and a question. Um, I think we won't really know until we see some of the papers come out to see how that was done, how that was diagnosed, um, what the definitions were. Um, I think we here uh, in the Bay Area are in a really great place because we do have a great PCR as well as serologic assays. Um, you know, if we see uh, patients who are having those symptoms, I would suggest that people, uh, especially the clinicians on the front lines, just be super aware of this. Um, I, I think it's it's too early to tell. Thanks so much, Ubi. Um, okay, great. Uh, will Stanford reconsider allowing staff to travel to less fortunate locations uh, to help? Um, uh, anybody uh, want to fill that one? Uh, Lucy, um, perhaps? Yeah. Um, well, we have had um, some healthcare workers who wanted to go to New York. Uh, which is fine. Um, however, um, they need to be in self-quarantine for 14 days after returning. Um, that, that's the county's uh, rule, and, and that would be ours as well, um, to be on the safe side. Um, but of course, we're not discouraging people who want to volunteer to do that um, at all. It's just that that's the requirement uh, when they come back. Um, thanks, Lucy. And there's also a, a connected question about taking transfers. Um, I don't know if there's been discussion on that. I think there might have been some discussion on triaging admissions towards us. Nira? Yeah, I can answer that. So at Valley Care, we have started accepting transfers from outside hospitals, both for higher levels of care and for patients who are interested in enrolling in the Remdesivir NIH-sponsored uh, trial. At the uh, Palo Alto SHC campus, we are accepting transfers for patients who need higher levels of care. Thus far, we have not broadly accepted patients who have uh, research, who want to enroll in certain research trials, in part because I think the research committee is still trying to prioritize which trials will go live and a timeline for each of this. But we do want to make sure that patients get you know, the clinical care that they need and, and those doors are Thanks so much, Nira. Um, we're just about uh, up on time. I do want to bring up one, uh, uh, Dr. Pinsky, Ben, thanks for answering a question that was pretty popular. I just want to make sure people got your response. Do you mind commenting on the, uh, the PCR? There was a question about the sensitivity and how good it is. Sure. Oh, can you hear me? There we go. Perfect. Um, 
Yes, so we did, uh, um, the way that we looked at sensitivity was to look at individuals who had repeat testing. Um, so uh, we evaluated uh, those individuals that had a repeat test within 48 hours. And in the answered question, there were 228 uh, folks between March 4th and uh, April 4th. And of those nine um, had a discrepancy. Um, so that's where we're getting that uh, 4%. Now that does not necessarily mean that the sensitivity is 96%. Um, however, it gives us a good idea that um, the false negative rate of our test is quite low. Um, so hopefully that helps answer that uh, question. Thanks so much, Ben. And we'll keep uh, inviting you back as you get more data you think it might be helpful regarding numbers. I'm sure over time we'll get even more. Please, please, we're welcome to share more information, but that's really helpful. Um, ben, what, can one we, last, one yes, other, uh, sorry, yes. can I just say one other thing? The data that we've seen is, um, is similar to what has been reported by the University of Washington. So um, we're using similar tests. And so um, I guess it's good to see this uh, replicated in another uh, institution. Okay, great. Thank you so much. I'm going to end on one last question. Um, a song brought to attention. It's been a common question that regarding the serology test, uh, I just want to make it clear that uh, people are asking, can that test be ordered in primary care? Um, it's been my experience that it has been being ordered and it can be. Uh, is there any limitations, Scott? I know it's pretty much available. There's been some concern that we want to make sure it's available for healthcare workers and those with the highest need. Um, any limitations on who can order that? No, I mean, we've had... Uh, well We've had plenty of capacity in the lab, um, but, oh, I'm sorry, I thought you were uh, asking me wrong. Both, really. Uh, so it sounds like it's, it's open to everybody. Anybody can certainly order it. So, and there's no limit on capacity from your perspective. Asang, any thought, comments? Yes, there is an interdisciplinary work group uh, meeting every day led by uh, Norm Risk and Danny Lund to try to figure out what is the uh, optimal uh, use of this uh, in community setting. Uh, we're very excited about the epidemiology and the research to try to understand uh, immunity patterns uh, in the community and uh, targeted populations like health workers. We're getting a lot of curiosity seekers, curious whether they're positive or negative. And the problem with that is that we cannot today say anything definitive about necessarily what a positive or a negative test implies in terms of immunity uh, and uh, safety. And so we have a lot of concern that people may misunderstand and misinterpret uh, positive serology results to mean that they are not uh, vulnerable to reinfection uh, and that they are not a danger to others and that that could actually uh, backfire and do more harm than good. So we're trying to figure out what's the wisest uh, uh, and most responsible way to deploy this uh, in the primary care setting as opposed to the research and healthcare uh, setting. And Errol, if I could make a comment on that, I think this is an example of, of great technology. Um, and I think uh, Asan's approach of saying we have to use it carefully is exactly the right one. We all wanna know, I had a respiratory illness for three weeks. I would love to know Scott if I'm positive, but I know what to do with that result. And I think we wanna be really careful when we offer it um, largely. I think some things we do not know is whether immunity, uh, whether an IgG response means that you're uh, immune and how long is, uh, is, is there durable immunity. Uh, we also don't know uh, what's going to really happen um, in the fall uh, with, with recrudescence. So I think what we want to do is certainly in certain individuals, knowing the results can be helpful. I think the Sera surveys, in my opinion, are are just what we really need to see is, you know, what's happening in the healthcare workforce, what's happening in the community, um, what's happening in underserved populations in terms of uh, seropositivity. That'll tell us a little bit about herd immunity. But on an individual basis, I think um, we just have to be very careful what we tell individuals. And, and my concern uh, mirrors what Song is saying, is that if somebody finds out they're IgG positive, does that mean they stop uh, uh, like safety behaviors for themselves as well as for their family members or people they live with. So again, this is awesome technology. It will, I know, be used carefully. Uh, and whoever uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, gets the result um, has to be careful when they, when they give the information to the patient. The patient usually hears, um, and we've all been patients, the first sentence, 
you're positive, you're negative, and they don't hear the but, we don't know, and let's follow in this. So I think that is something to consider. Yes, and, and related to that, we're, we're working on neutralization assays yeah, that so would be great. Yeah. to see how they correlate with the serology. Exactly. So we will learn more about that soon. Yeah, I think this is, it's, um, I, I think uh, Scott would agree, it's a, the, first, the first super important step. Um, and then I think all the science that will build on this will be great. Awesome. Uh, guys, thank you so much. Uh, with that, I think uh, uh, we'll go ahead and end this morning. I want to thank again all our panelists. Ubi, thanks for the great presentation. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. And please continue to give us feedback on how we can make this uh, as valuable to you as possible. I hope everybody has a great rest of the week. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. you.